Green. Welcome to the 2023 Boise March for Life. I want to make just a few opening comments here. Thank you for your patience. You had some issues with the sound, and uh, but we got it working now. So uh, we're just so thankful and honored that you're here on the very first ever post row Boise March for Life. In 1865, the Civil War ended and the 13th Amendment was passed abolishing slavery. One of the key figures in the abolitionist movement was Frederick Douglass. I just got through reading a book about him this past year by David Blight. Um, it's an incredible, very thick uh, biography and was just amazed at the life of this man who gave so much of his time and energy, who grows up from slavery, like Booker T. Washington and others, and, and fought to abolish slavery in the United States of America. What is interesting is that 90 years later, in Mississippi, there were a couple of white men, and you can go ahead, Jackson, take this picture and hold it up for the crowd to see real high. A couple of white men in Mississippi, they kidnapped a 14-year-old boy named Emmett Till who was in town visiting his grandparents, and they tortured him, and they mutilated him, and he was brutally murdered 90 years later. And that actually happened two days before my father was born at the old Cameron Telfair Hospital in Savannah, Georgia. That same year, 1955, is when Rosa Parks was arrested because she refused to give up her seat to a white man on a bus in Birmingham. 90 years later. And so I think we can learn a valuable lesson from this movement. What happened from Frederick Douglass to Emmett Till? How, how did we get in the span of a century from this incredible elation and this victory and finally now slavery is abolished and we've won this this great fight that for, for decades and decades abolitionists have been fighting for to achieve that and then nearly 100 years later have this happen. How did that happen and, and what can we as a movement learn from that today? And so there, there's some very interesting things. Frederick Douglass said that part of the problem was he said slavery did not die an honest death. He said because that slavery died in military conquest and not out of moral conviction, because it was a political necessity, but it was, it was not an enlightenment, a movement enlightened among American people, he knew that there would be problems. And he said, we can conquer Southern armies, but we cannot conquer Southern hatred. And we saw that 90 years later, how true that statement was. There were three things that contributed to Emmett Till and Rosa Parks and so many others and what happened was the fact, the will of the Northern people, the, the, the people of the North, they, they were just tired. They, they had fought long and hard. They had heard about slavery and the abolitionist movement. And so for years and years and years, this was all they heard about. And they, they were just tired of the fight. They were ready to be over and done with, okay, we passed the 13th Amendment and now the 14th and the 15th, I, I think we've done enough. We've achieved everything that we can achieve. Now it's just, let those people south of the Mason Dixon alone. They can do whatever they want to do. And that's why Reconstruction failed. Not only was it the will of the Northern people that grew soft, but the will of the people of the South was stronger. And it was much stronger than the people of the North because they refused to give up their way of life. Amen. And then as a result of that, there was a false narrative that was created. Probably the only time in history when the losers wrote the narrative, they wrote the story, and this became known as the lost cause. And they changed the narrative. And I see that we could be in the danger of having that same thing happen in the pro-life movement here. By the way, do you realize there are only two social movements in the United States of America that have been fought over personhood? And that was slavery and abortion. Slavery and abortion. Amen. Roe is dead. Roe is dead. Abortion is not dead. Abortion is not dead. The unnatural killing 
of a preborn child in the womb still continues to go on in these United States of America. So we, our will has to be stronger than their will. Our will has to be his will. We cannot tire, we cannot fatigue. We must continue to march for life every single year if need be to show that we will speak for those who cannot speak for themselves Amen. and we will defend the defenseless until all life in America is respected and protected under Amen. law. Yeah. We're not going to allow the other side to change the narrative and we're not going to forget our past and that's why Today we remember Cohen Chenoweth and Dr. Rory Peterson, Amen. Leanne McAllister, Chuck Ullincott, Debbie Roper, Shirley McKaig, Bill Molitor, Ramona Burbridge, Keith Kendall, Pat Benson, and so many countless others who did not live to see this day, but they died in faith knowing that this day would come. Amen. Tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Tomorrow is. Roe never lived to see its 50th birthday because of the work of God and his So we give honor to the brave justices of the Supreme Court who returned the power back to the people to protect life in our states. We honor the Honorable Justice Robin Brody for writing the majority decision in the recent Idaho Supreme Court ruling that determined there's no constitutional right to abortion in the state of Idaho. And we honor all of those who have prayed and wept, advocated, counseled, marched, donated, preached, taught, loved, and labored in this movement. We give you our heartfelt thanks. Amen. All glory, honor, and praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Amen. great God our Father, and we have this great victory in our nation. I want to introduce you to someone who's going to come and open us up in prayer, and uh, that's my pastor, Chris Wild of Capital Church in Meridian. One of the things that I love about Pastor Chris is that, like his father, He's not afraid to speak out on issues of controversy and issues of challenge. And uh, thank you, Pastor Chris. And now our legislative coordinator, Kerry Ullincott, is going to come and share with us a report about what's going on in the legislature this year. Okay. Thank you. It's just great to be here with you. I think this is one of the biggest crowds we've ever had. Right? for your faithfulness for year after year, decade after decade. You've been marching with us, uh, standing up for those who have no voice. I bless you and God blesses you, I know. So thank you. Um, this year would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe, excuse me, of Roe versus Wade. And even though we mourn the death of over 64 million unborn innocent children, we also <clears throat> celebrate today because Roe is no more. We are rejoicing that thousands of innocent unborn babies are being saved because growth is no more. And because growth is dead, many of our children are alive today. Thank you, God. Thank you.
one thing we we all love the unborn, and we love these protesters too. Don't yeah. we? Is Congressman Fulcher here? He said he was going to try to make it. Has anyone seen Congressman Fulcher? How out I make you see? Here's so. Um, all right. Well, maybe the good Congressman will get here later part of our rally. But we have Megan Wold here, who is our guest speaker here today. And Megan was law intern for Justice Alito, who wrote the majority opinion in Dobbs. And she's been very active in the pro-life movement. She is a, a mother, first and foremost, and she is an amazing pro-life advocate who is now lobbying here in the state capitol behind us for Right to Life of Idaho. We're very honored to have her working with our organization and uh, very grateful for her experience. And so please welcome her as she comes and shares with us today. and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Since the United States Supreme Court decided Roe v. Wade in 1972, an estimated 63 million lives have been lost to abortion in this country. Those are 63 million unique, irreplaceable, unrepeatable human lives. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor these 63 million individuals who we have lost. And please also join me in a moment of prayer for the protesters who, while exercising their First Amendment rights, are fundamentally mistaken about life, and we pray for them too. It was the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade that enabled the loss of those 63 million individuals. But today, Roe v. Wade is no longer law. Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case. And in that opinion, Justice Alito, writing for a majority of the court, described the errors of Roe. He described that at the time of the decision, a majority of states in this country prohibited some or all abortions. And yet, the Supreme Court issued a decision that read like legislation removing the ability of law-abiding citizens and people of good faith, like all of you gathered here, to look at life in the womb, to view an ultrasound, as a pregnant woman, to feel a baby move inside of your body, and to say, that is a life and that is worth protecting. Roe versus Wade took that power away from us, and the Dobbs decision has given it back. Yeah. This is a time of great joy. But as we celebrate the decision, we also celebrate the effort of this movement, which for 50 years spoke the truth about unborn life and the grave evil of abortion. The advocacy, the prayers, the votes, the legislation, the demands that people, that citizens made of their elected representatives. The people here today and millions of others around the country and now spanning generations who never let this issue go, never gave up, never admitted defeat. Because life is too precious. As much as we have to celebrate, and it is a great deal, 
we have even more left to do. Because in truth, God is not the culmination of the pro-life movement, but its second beginning. Roe versus Wade prevented Americans from enacting legal protections for unborn life, but now Americans can protect unborn life. And that places the locus of decision-making right here, in Idaho, for example, and in states across the country. And in Idaho, we already have, today, robust laws protecting life and prohibiting abortion. And since those laws have taken effect after Dobbs, hundreds of lives have been saved in this state. of the story in Idaho. When someone leaked a complete draft of Justice Alito's Dobbs opinion before it was finalized and published, we saw exactly how robust the opposition to Dobbs and to pro-life legislation would be. Yeah. Not only did protesters arrive on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court, but they came to the justices' homes. They interfered with their private lives, with their families, blasting their messages with megaphones, bringing TV cameras, and often doing so in contravention of federal law, which was not enforced. And one individual even reached Justice Kavanaugh's home after dark, armed with home invasion tools, a handgun, and a knife, and professing his intention to assassinate Justice Kavanaugh, one that he thankfully was not able to act upon. These things happened in part because the protesters and this assassin believed that they could yet change the outcome of Dobbs by influencing the justices or changing the makeup of the court. They acted to further their preferred policies on abortion, policies that would ensure abortion remained widely available throughout pregnancy. We have the power! Those protesters and that assassin failed in their mission. And Dobbs is now the law of the land but people with the same motivation can now, the same motivation to promote access to abortion can now do so at the state level by introducing legislation, by lobbying lawmakers, by putting initiatives and referenda to a vote of the people. And if pro-abortion advocates were willing to protest outside private homes and even assassinate a justice, should we doubt that they would aggressively advocate to change the law in places like Idaho? Of course not. No. And remember that there are places like California and New York where abortion remains widely available and where pro-abortion advocates can turn vast sums of money raised in those places to states like Idaho to promote access to abortion here. In short, the forces arrayed against the pro-life movement and advocacy in Idaho are many, and they are strong, they are angry, and they are highly motivated. So now more than ever, Idahoans who want to protect life in this state must act to do so, and we must act fearlessly. We must vote, share our views on life, including by persuading our friends and families and neighbors. We must continue our prayers and our vigils, and we must march at events like this to show that the pro-life movement is also strong, also motivated, and will not stop acting yeah. to protect life. Right. And we must continue to operate crisis pregnancy centers and support pregnant women and their babies now more than ever. We must donate generously from our time and treasure so that it can never be said that pro-lifers in Idaho neglect the needs of the women and the babies they care so deeply about. We have the power! With so much to do and with such forces arrayed against pro-life efforts, we simply don't know what the future holds for Idaho. And that is why we must continue to act. We must not rest, we cannot rest, in continuing to share our pro-life values and acting to further them. I have confidence, though, that if we do the things we must, 
if we keep marching, speaking, voting, advocating, if we share the value of unborn life fearlessly with our friends, family, and neighbors, then we will prevail because of the truth of our message. Yeah. Our family welcomes a new baby, our fourth and our first boy. He was, thank you. He was perfectly healthy at birth, but he developed a septic infection, which landed him in the ER and then the NICU on his two-week birthday. He spent 12 days in the NICU, during which my husband Theo and I rotated to visit him as often as we could and for as long as possible while still caring for the needs of our other children. We were blanketed in the prayers and generosity of friends far and wide. In fact, I think um, Dorothy Boone, who's the chairwoman of the Republican Party, is here today somewhere. Um, and she babysat our children for us. That was the love and the care and the enthusiasm she had for helping our family. And praise God, today our baby boy is home with us, and we are grateful. Yeah, yeah. I bring this up not to describe my son's experience as what the nurses called an old timer in the NICU, uh, but to describe the experiences of others that we witnessed there. First, as I approached the NICU each day, many times a day for visits, I studied the pictures on the walls. The hallways were lined with images of children, toddlers, preschoolers, and school-aged children of all levels, all vibrant and happy. And in the hands of each one of them was a picture of a tiny baby in the NICU, a picture of that child, each one a NICU graduate. Those pictures tell the truth that babies born prematurely, some at 24 weeks gestation or even earlier, are babies that their tiny bodies are perfectly formed, that their lives, when protected, are just as valuable as the lives of any other grown person that we may know. Those babies grow up to be those children holding those pictures of themselves during their NICU stays. And while staying in the NICU, we met some babies who would grow to be the children in those photographs. One of our roommates was newly born at just 26 weeks gestation. He was impossibly tiny. You could have held him in the palm of your hand. And he was resting in an incubator attached to tubes and wires and a team of nurses and doctors were working tirelessly to save his life. And his parents were there, loving him a tiny miracle. Another roommate was preparing to be released from the NICU. He was nursing now and had cleared his last health hurdles. He was nearly ready to go home. And his mother told me that if he had been born that day, he would have been nearly 35 weeks gestated, still premature, even then. Another miracle. Another witness that life in the womb is indeed life. And on another day, I watched as twin babies in a neighboring womb were rocked and swallowed by their adoptive parents as they prepared to go home. I couldn't help but wonder if those were two babies here in Idaho who were saved by God and by Idaho law. Would those babies have been aborted under other circumstances? Those babies who were now in the arms of their loving adoptive parents and ready to go home? What experiences like that in the NICU crystallize is what's happening inside the womb, and not just at 26 weeks, but throughout a pregnancy, that it is a human life, and that it's allowed to, to grow and to develop, and if protected, that life will grow to be a human just like any one of us. And that is what motivates the people here at this march. That is what motivates our movement. And it is true, it is profoundly true. Yes. And this science has only helped to show the truth of what we speak for. And that is why I'm confident that if we continue to bring this message to our friends, to our neighbors, to our families, and if we do so with the love and charity that Idahoans have shown to my family during the crisis that we endured. This is a people of prayer. We are a people of great love, of enormous generosity, and with true passion for life. And together, we will protect life in Idaho, and Idaho will remain a state 
that love the unborn. Would uh, Robin Waters and uh, Pastor Monty Sears make their way up to the top of the steps here? And while they're coming up, I just want to say um, how thankful we are for all of the uh, pastors and priests, Bishop uh, Peter Christensen and support of the diocese and the, all the faith leaders and people in our community that that are willing to uh, be involved in this issue, to speak out on that. All of the pro-life advocates, we have so many groups uh, represented here today. Uh, Live for Life, Life Runners, 40 Days, uh, Idaho United for Life, Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center, Birthright Boise, uh, Reliance Centers, Family Health Care, uh, Family Policy Alliance, Idaho Chooses Life, uh, Choose Life Idaho, uh, Treasure Valley Teens for Life, Students for Life, and I don't know if I miss anybody else, but thank Fair all of you for coming out and supporting this. We really, really appreciate you. Also, I love you. Lutheran Church. Yes, I love the signs. And uh, thank you for representing and being a part of this. It's an honor. And also, thankful for our protesters for coming out. And, uh, we're, we're glad that they're here today. I think on the other side over there could very well be a Bernard Nathanson, the abortion doctor who converted and did the silent screen video. There could be an Abby Johnson over there. There could be a Ramona Trevino. There, there could be another David Ripley. There could be a Saul of Tarsus over there who has not yet experienced his come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And one day will be standing over here with us. Never forget that. Um, I want to share just a couple of interesting statistics here with you that uh, are really great. I got this here this morning. Bear with me. Here we go. So, Lifeline Pregnancy Center in Nampa, uh, they were founded back in 1985, and um, Robin Waters has been involved with them for around 22 to 25 years, so nearly, nearly a quarter of a century of work with Lifeline Pregnancy Center. Um, they, last year alone, they saw 870 clients, they had 300 pregnancy tests, over 220 ultrasounds, 80 abortion vulnerable clients, they had 343 clothing resource appointments, and they had five people who made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ through their counselor. Yeah. And so it's it's great that we have Robin here along with her pastor, Pastor Monty, who's going to close us out in prayer here in just a little bit. Uh, but I, they, they just opened this brand new ministry uh, there at Lifeline called The Nesting Place. And it's a home for, for uh, expectant mothers who, are, who have no resource, who have no support, who have no help. And they have this home that's opened up right next to the clinic there in Nampa for them. It's just an amazing ministry. But, but also this, every year in honor of my grandmother, Margaret Herring, who founded the Coastal Pregnancy Care Center in Savannah, Georgia back in 1983, we have chosen to give an award to someone who exemplifies that spirit and who works in the trenches of this pro-life movement that we're involved in. And so this year, in conjunction with all of this, we wanted to recognize Robin Waters with the Margaret Herring Award for her dedication and service to the protection of life, mothers, and children. If you or Pastor Monty would like to say a word about the nesting place, uh, we'd love to hear about us. Thank you so much. It is so good to be with you today. This beautiful Idaho day. Yeah. We have so much to celebrate. God is a good God. Yes, that's right. That's right. 63 years ago, my mother had abortion pills in her hand. 
Yeah. And her doctor told her, Sonia, if you will ingest these pills, you will abort the fetus. And my mother opened her mouth and got those pills six inches from her mouth. And later in life, when I found out I was adopted, she told me something stopped me and I was born. But how many recognize it wasn't something that stopped my mother that day? Yeah. 63 years ago, it was someone that stopped my mother. And one of the reasons why I was born is because my mother had supportive parents. There was a place for my mother to bring me home to. Yeah. And what we are finding at Lifeline is that many beautiful women do not have a place to bring their baby home to. If they have the baby, they are ostracized from their family. So we are so excited to announce we are so close to opening the nesting place. We are removing an obstacle so beautiful uh, women can bring their babies to a safe, godly place, learn life skills, be discipled by people who love the Lord, and love them and we are removing an obstacle and we believe there will be babies that are born because mothers have a place to take their baby to. Can you say amen? Yeah. I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank you. You play a vital part in the life of the pre-born, the unborn. If it were not for your prayer, if it were not for your commitment, I wonder how many more babies would be killed. But we stand for life, we stand for God, and we stand for babies. Can you say amen? Amen. And as I conclude in prayer, I believe that prayer coupled with faith moves the hand of Almighty God. That's right. How many here got some faith today? Let me see your hands. Would you join me as we pray today? Father, in your holy word, you told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, he said, I, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Father David wrote in Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 and 14, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. He wrote, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Jesus, you said in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Listen closely to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In Proverbs chapter 13, excuse me, 31, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless that they may get justice. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the privilege to worship you and to meet in this public setting, open heaven, and declare that you are God. Yeah. That you are good God and that your plan for humanity is redemption. Yeah. Father, we speak over each and every person in America and around the world. We ask that you would change hearts. Give us a love for life. Yeah. Give us a love for the unborn, the preborn, the babies, Lord. We thank you for legislatures that are that are changing laws and, and helping with the pro-life movement. God, we ask for open doors. We ask for changed hearts. We ask for your favor. And God, if there is a cause to get behind, it is the cause of God to stand for life. Yes. You said that you came, the enemy came to steal, 
kill and destroy, but you came to give us life and that life more abundant. So God, we stand in line with your word, with your heart, and we pray that you would change the hearts of those that do not stand for life, that do not honor life. God, change hearts and minds. And Father, may our greatest days in this movement lie ahead of us. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shouted a great big Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Money. And it's also good to have Bishop Peter here and uh, representing. And uh, this, I can't tell you what the support of the diocese has meant to the pro-life movement here and having him uh, at the helm. It's been such a blessing. Um, we, I heard that we had this And before you go, we, I, I just got news that I think we have the sound up over here for our worship team. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to close out here in a worship song. Uh, there are offering buckets from the Right to Life tables that are going to be passed around. If you're interested in making a donation, you can. There's also uh, more information and ways to donate at the Right to Life tables that are on either side of the steps here. Uh, but we want to close this out in worship. You know, when the evil spirit from the Lord was troubling Saul, when David would come and he would play and he would do praise and worship, that evil spirit departed. And what I have found and experienced with these pro-life gatherings is that any time we have opposition and any time that there's protesters, if we will come together in praise and worship, amen, it does something to the mood and the atmosphere. It really does invite the presence of the Holy Spirit here among us. So I just invite you to close out here with us in worship. Thank you to Kim Bowie and the Capitol Church uh, worship team for joining us today. And uh, that will end our, our rally here for Boise 2023. Thank you.